Hello, and welcome to part four of our series on the digestive system, where we're going to look at uh, the intestines. Now, to start out with, in the organs that we're going to be focusing in on this lecture, the small intestine uh, and the colon, the colon being the large intestine, the small intestine is going to be involved primarily with digestion and absorption. And so we're going to have digestion occurring within the small intestine, and so we're going to be looking at associated glands uh, later on in the lecture. But essentially what's occurring within the small intestine is going to be coupled to secretions coming from either the liver or the pancreas. And so we'll talk about those in the glands uh, in part five of this lecture series. But ultimately what's going to happen is digestion is going to be completed within the small intestine. So we're taking those... Uh, food particles that have been passed through the stomach where they were mixed together with acids and pepsinogen. The stomach uh, is going to kind of slowly release those food particles, kind of squeezing uh, the stomach and injecting small amounts of food particles into the small intestine. Uh, as the small intestine receives those particles, enteroendocrine cells within the small intestine are going to release their hormones. Those hormones are going to be transported to the liver and to the pancreas, and they're going to trigger the release of enzymes and bile into the small intestine so that when we have the materials to be digested, we're going to mix it with the materials that are going to be involved with its chemical breakdown. So within the small intestine, we're going to finalize digestion, breaking down our food particles into individual little monomers, so individual amino acids, individual sugar units, uh, break lipids down from big globs of lipids into small lipids. Um, all of that's going to be occurring within the small intestine. In addition, we need to have absorption occurring. Again, it's not enough that we you know, put food in our mouth, grind it up, swallow it, pass it through, and generate feces you know, a day or two later. Uh, what we need to do is break it down through the process of digestion and then absorb it. Uh, bring these individual monomers, the amino acids, the individual sugar uh, units, across our epithelial lining where they become available to the cells within our body. So again, what we're looking at is going to be an area that we need lots of absorption occurring and we need a lot of surface area available. And so what we're going to see is that the mucosal surface, the lining surface of our small intestine is going to be greatly increased. And this is going to occur at a variety of levels. It occurs at the cellular level in that the simple columnar cells that are lining our epithelium within our small intestine are going to have microvilli along the surface. Again, non-motile structures, actin cores, but increasing the surface area of the individual cells. We're going to have mucosal folds called villi. So in essence, we're going to have that lamina propria, the loose connective tissue, as finger-like extensions, which are going to be covered by our epithelial cells. So we're going to have extensions of mucosa, extensions of lamina propria, our loose connective tissue, covered by more epithelia. We can pack more cells in on these finger-like projections. And then ultimately, we're going to have plique circularis. Plique circularis are these permanent submucosal folds. And so we have an extension of that submucosa, that dense irregular connective tissue, extending out into the lumen to increase the area where we can have villi. And we're going to increase the villi because we have increased area where we can have the cells. We have more cells, so we're going to have more microvilli. So we can very dramatically increase the amount of surface area that's available through these modifications. <clears throat> if we take a look at the cells that are lying in the epithelia, uh, the prominent cells, the most common cells, are going to be the absorptive cells. Uh, the absorptive cells are going to be tall columnar cells, so simple squamous, I'm sorry, not simple squamous, simple columnar cells, a single cell layer thick, cells that are taller than they are wide because they're going to be involved with absorbing these materials along the luminal surface and so along the striated border, the microvilli, and they're going to be pumping these materials, they're going to be processing these materials, bringing them into the lamina propria underlying it. The cells are going to have a lot of basal, I'm sorry, a, a basal nuclei, so kind of oval nuclei all lined up in a row uh, because there's going to be a lot of processing of the materials and bringing these materials in uh, as the cells are, uh, as the materials are passing through these cells. 
Scattered among these absorptive cells are going to be goblet cells, and these are similar to the goblet cells we've seen in other regions of the body, involved with uh, secreting mucus, and that mucus is going to be lubricating and protecting the surface of our epithelium. Additional cells that we're going to find within the, in the intestines are going to be panis cells. Panis cells are going to be uh, very acidophilic cells, cells with uh, kind of reddish or pinkish acidophilic secretory granules. They're going to be found within short glands called crypts of Lieberkuhn uh, within the intestine. So at the base of villi, we're going to have these little uh, intestinal glands, crypts of Lieberkuhns, and then within this region, we'll have panis cells. Panis cells are going to be involved with secreting lysozyme, and lysozyme is going to be an example of an antibacterial enzyme. Now, the absorptive cells, the goblet cells, and the panis cells will be relatively easy to identify within the intestines. We'll also have additional cells, which would be harder to identify. We're going to have intraendocrine cells, essentially hormone-secreting cells within the walls of our digestive system, which are going to be producing hormones and amines, which are going to affect digestion, so essentially triggering either locally or uh, digestive system glands to stimulate these cells to release the materials to assist with the process of digestion. We're also going to have M cells as an example of an antigen presenting cells overlying our, our Peyer's patches. Now if we take a look at this, again it's important to be able to recognize the difference between the intestinal uh, villi and the crypts of Lieberkuhn. So in this slide we can see the finger-like projections that are extending up where we've got luminal space around them, uh, labeled over here on two. We've got the villi kind of going up, and then we've got continuous lamina propria without the spaces, but we have an epithelial lining extending down in the area of one on this uh, image. These are the crypts of Lieberkuhn. Uh, they're also called intestinal glands. Simple tubular glands uh, that are going to be essentially pushed down into the lamina propria, all of which are going to end above the muscularis mucosa. So we're dealing with this within our mucosal level, uh, within our mucosal layer within uh, the small intestine. Towards the base of these crypts of Lieberkuhn, the uh, intestinal glands are going to be the panis cells. Again, these are cells that are going to have uh, eosinophilic or bright pink, bright red uh, uh, cytoplasmic granules because this is where the lysozyme is going to be stored prior to being released by these cells. If we take a look at different regions within the small intestine, uh, the first region is going to be du duodenum. Uh, relatively few goblet cells, but it's going to be characterized by many, many submucosal duodenal glands down in one on this diagram uh, to the right. These are going to be Bruner's glands, and these are going to be secreting a neutral or slightly alkaline mucus into um, the contents into the lumen of the duodenum. Again, this is going to be important because if we think about the high acidity that's coming from the materials in the stomach, we want to neutralize that so that the uh, acidity does not damage our intestinal aligning cells. We don't want to have a, an erosion or digestion of these cells damaging our epithelial lining. So we need to neutralize it with the secretions from these Brunner's glands. We go down to the jejunum. Uh, this is the majority of the um, small intestine. We're going to have long leaf-like villi, many plique circularis. So what we're going to be looking at is an area with lots and lots of surface area. And that's going to be important because this is going to be the area where most of the absorption is going to be occurring. Have an intermediate number of goblet cells uh, because we're again, we're going to have many, many of the absorptive cells are going to be present within our epithelial lining. In general, uh, no submucosal mucus secreting glands, so no Brunner's glands and no Peyer's patches uh, within the wall. And so it's a relatively uh, simple structure to the organ within the jejunum. The final region of the small intestine is going to be the ileum. Uh, this is a shorter region towards the end where it's about to exit into the colon, exit into the large intestine. We're going to have fewer villi present there. The villi are going to have a, a short, almost broad or club-like appearance to them. Uh, and they're going to be lined primarily with goblet cells. So still some um, absorptive cells, some of those simple columnar um, cells with microvilli along the surface, uh, but many more goblet cells are going to be present. Uh, the ileum is going to be characterized by the fact we have fewer villi, uh, but we're going to have Peyer's patches within the walls. Again, the Peyer's patches are the example of the lymphoid nodules, the circular aggregate of small lymphocytes, or in this case, 
the stars are located. We've got germinal centers. So we're going to have activated uh, lymphocytes in that region, cells that are, are present, uh, and probably producing antibodies because they've been activated by some type of material that's passing through uh, this region, and they're mounting an immune response to that. Again, the major characteristics associated with the small intestine is that we need to have greatly increased surface area, and so we need that in order to have enough surface area to be able to bring in the materials that have been digested to be able to absorb the materials that we need uh, that are used by the body. So we've got microvilli as those finger-like projections on individual cells. We've got villi as mucosal folds where we've got the lamina propria extending up, increasing the area where we can pack these cells, these absorptive cells in. And then finally, we've got the plicae circularis as this permanent submucosal fold which extends up and increases the area where we can pack in the mucosa, so we can pack in more villi, and because we have more villi, we can pack in more cells. Because we have more cells, we have more microvilli, and overall, very dramatically increasing the surface area within the small intestines. Again, it's important to recognize the difference between the villi, these finger-like uh, projections that are extending up uh, on uh, the image to the left, versus the crypts of Lieberkuhn, the intestinal glands, where we've got these finger-like projections. So in essence, the villi, uh, you've got the lamina propria to the center, the connective tissue, um, lots of collagen, uh, relatively fine collagen, so even pink staining appearance, but lots of small lymphocytes, those basophilic cells, and we've got the, the kind of open space surrounding that. As opposed to the crypts of Lieberkuhn on the right-hand side, where in essence, we've got the open space to the inside of each of these little intestinal glands and the lamina propria with its pink staining from the connective tissue, uh, the, the collagen, uh, and all of these small lymphocytes kind of surrounding each of these glandular structures. <coughs> Excuse me. We move now into the large intestine. What we're gonna find is an organ that's much shorter than the small intestine, uh, but it has a much wider lumen uh, it doesn't have any villi, so we don't need to have uh, the massive amount of increase in surface area that we had within the small intestine, so no villi, but it still has those intestinal glands. We still have many relatively deep crypts of Lieberkuhn. Lots and lots of lymphoid cells, lots of nodules, which are going to be found scattered in among the mucosa underneath the epithelial lining, underneath uh, and between these crypts of Lieberkuhn as well as lymph nodules, circular aggregates of these uh, lymph cells. Uh, the muscularis externa around the outside is going to be a little bit different. We still have that inner circular layer, but outside of that, we're going to have the tinea coli. Uh, this is essentially a modification of that outer longitudinal layer, and instead of a, a complete outer longitudinal layer completely around it, it's going to be composed of three thick longitudinal bands. So you have a thickened region of the muscularis externa, and then it's almost absent. You just have the circular layer, and then it's going to pick up a little bit again uh, as we go around the circumference of the large intestine. We take a look at the cells on the large intestine. We still see a simple columnar epithelium. We're going to see absorptive cells uh, along the surface. They're going to have irregular, regular, uh, relatively short microvilli. So they're still involved with absorption. They're going to be absorbing water that's been added to the digestive system, but not a whole lot of absorption that's going to be occurring within. We're not looking at uh, absorption of nutrients uh, within the large intestine. Many, many abundant goblet cells because we're going to be packing and processing these waste materials compacting it into feces, which has uh, the characteristics, it has the potential to, to uh, grind or abrade across the epithelial lining. And this finishes up our overview of uh, the intestines. Uh, come back for part five, where we're going to start to talk about the glands associated with the digestive system. As always, if you have any questions, feel free to email me at hoffmanj at arcadia.edu. Thank you.